I'm Marilyn Walker, and I have two of my team here with me. Uh, two of my graduate students is Kevin there, Kevin Bowden, and Jackie Wu, who have been working on some of these uh, projects. So um, I'm going to just talk about conversational agents for children. And the first thing I, I want to say is that I have two projects now where we're looking at building a conversational agent for children, but I've never done anything for children before. And I have never done anything in kind of a learning setting. So this is a really good uh, opportunity for me to kind of learn uh, from, from other people. So I'd be interested in any kind of comment, no matter how left field you, know, you think it, it might be. We have one project funded by National Science Foundation in Cyber Learning Program. And this project is it's a dialogue agents for listening comprehension. And the idea is to engage a child uh, socially in a, in, in a dialogue system to help improve their social inter, uh, verbal interaction skills and their, and their listening comprehension. And um, I'll tell this little story, some of you already, I already told it to. So I submitted a full medium proposal and then I heard from Tanya Karelski that it wasn't funded and she said, you know, review of feedback, the panel, they couldn't understand, you know, why you didn't propose to build a full dialogue system to interact with children. And I said, well, because everybody knows, you know, speech recognition doesn't work for children. I, I, I said, I, I didn't think I could actually carry on a dialogue with a child. And she kind of, she stops kind of in her tracks and then she says, well, we funded two or three other projects for uh, dialogue system interaction with children where they didn't find out until after they were like 18 months in the project that speech, in, uh, speech recognition didn't work for children. She said, so they're all busy trying to retrofit their project goals once they kind of discovered that speech recognition doesn't work for children. And she said, but you know, I still, I want you to go ahead and try, you know, to build, you know, that version of dialogue system that interacts with children. And so I'll give you an eager, you know, so you can, you can kind of show that you can do something. So I'm still, you know, <clears throat> still thinking, well, it's just not going to work, right? But. Um, because we want to be able to get the speech recognition to work well enough, but maybe maybe we can, and maybe Abby or other people here can suggest to me their like special tricks that we can do that. So that so the idea here with this is that we have any kind of uh, story, say like Aesop's Fables, which are often used in teaching setting, and we can automatically convert the story content. Um, to a dialogic interaction with a child and automatically personalize the system and interact. So that's, that's the one project. The other project is funded by Hitachi and Hitachi's given us this um, emu robot that you see there which is not available commercially and they're working very closely with us to um, build a dialogue system that runs on this robot and our idea with this is that we could put this robot in the Seymour Marine Discovery Center, which is part of UCSC campus. It's down by the water, it's not up on the hill where we are. And they have these exhibits and it's a very interactive science learning environment. And so we're working on a, on a dialogue system that will interact with children in, in that environment. And kind of parallel to this, I have a team just generally working on, we've been funded under the Amazon Alexa Prize and Jackie and Kevin were kind of, Kevin was our team leader and Jackie's like our key, kind of key systems level programmer actually in her, one of her roles on that project uh, couldn't get along without her kind of thing. And then, but then she's also uh, obviously contributing a lot to the, to the research side on that. And so we built that on the Alexa platform, but we're also looking at putting that on CMU's Dialport platform. And so Tony from the CMU Dialport team is going to talk a little bit after this about how they're building multimodal dialogue interaction capability there at CMU as a, data, a way to do data collection for dialogue. What do we need to create conversational learning agents for children? Basically, we kind of need a whole bunch of magic you know, some kind of conversational fairy dust to kind of pull all this technology together and actually really make, you know, interesting systems. And I'm, I think it's a really um, challenging problem. Um, there's so many outstanding issues just for dialogue systems, I think, in general. Like Chad said, you kind of get the impression that you've got Alexa in your house 
and that, you know, that this technology is just around the corner, you know, have a different, a whole different talk I could give about the, you know, kind of gaps in the technology and what's there and what, what isn't there. Maybe you know from your own interactions with these devices that actually it's, they're not conversational. You, they're more like one shot, you know, question answering. The issues that I'm kind of really interested with don't even kind of come up so much in the Alexa environment because I'm interested in the ongoing conversation over an extended period of time. And I think they're really outstanding issues on a research level with being able to do personalization, with scaling uh, the conversational interaction to new domains or different kinds of users and being able to quickly adapt to new domains and also just even in the very task-oriented dialogue context of being able to have um, multi-domain and multimodal systems. So those are kind of the problems that I've been working on for 20 years now. So part of my perspective, and this kind of comes from like my, the work that I did at AT&T Labs between say 1997 and 2003, we had uh, we had really good speech recognition and we had really good text-to-speech and we had these data-driven systems for training the speech recognizer and also for the text-to-speech engine, but a lot of the stuff that was in the middle was still completely handcrafted and the dialogue management was scripted dialogue interactions. So the whole idea was that it was a design paradigm and that you'd had voice user interface designers kind of come in and write prompts for system interaction and that then you, you know, deployed the system and you did an iterate and test kind of approach to kind of craft the system to something that could kind of execute a task. And then when, it, you know, when you had it good enough, you would, you know, deploy that and then you would go on to the next one. And what we, the problem that we faced was that when we had a successful system and we transferred it out to the business units, they came back and AT&T Solutions shopped it around and they came back and they had like, they wanted us to build 70 systems in a single year that could handle, do things, you know, like customer care dialogues in different domains. And there is absolutely no way, given the state of the art of the technology at that point in time, that we could ever have ever dreamed of building 70 systems in a single year. And if you consider like the How May I Help You system that was one of our AT&T Lab's big successes, just the speech data for that system alone was 10 years worth of customer care data. So, so th th that was the kind of problem that we're facing and that's kind of why in, in my work, you know, since then, I've, I've worked on trying to build these very general technologies, uh, stuff that I think, you know, can, can um, help you help us do this automatic adaptation to a new domain and I really kind of eschewed any kind of uh, interest in scripted in things that are like a fully scripted dialogue but I can completely understand if you're an educational practitioner and you want something in the classroom that that's you know what you know what you're going to do um, because it, as I said I think that you know the technology is just uh, it's just not there and so you know I'm really interested in personalization, and it's just impossible. I, you know, I feel like there's just no way you can do it. You cannot write a script, a different script for every child. There's no way. You can't even write like a set of um, utterances that are in, intended to be used in a particular context. You can't even do a very good job of that, that are, you know, for, for different children at different levels of reading and stuff. So I really believe that it's important to kind of invest in these technologies that are, you know, automatic behavior generation and will kind of, you know, stand the test of time that way. That's, that's my perspective. And one of the, the problem that we have with the cyber learning grant is that we want to carry on, con uh, uh, we want to carry on a dialogue around the content of a story. And even though there are storytelling agents out there, so I hope somebody corrects me that I'm completely wrong. But you know, if you go and you look at, at what's out there and what other people have done in the context of telling uh, a storytelling dialogue, nobody's kind of worked with a narrative content that can come from any different number of stories. So either the dialogues are scripted around a particular story, or they may have built a database for a particular story. You know, and so they, they don't have a technology that can kind of suck in a bunch of story content and spit out a dialogue management strategy 
for having a dialogue around that story. And so um, I'm going to kind of tell you what some stuff that we're doing. So like I said, Aesop's fables get used a lot in teaching and you know they're kind of classic and um, so and we happen to have a resource where we have a deep representation of um, 36 different Aesop's fables. So this project that we're working on is going to focus on um, Aesop's fables and like I said what we want is we want to be able to kind of spit out a dialogic interaction around a, a, the content that's in, in an Aesop's fable. And so what, for us, that means, you know, we want to develop the representations, the dialogue management strategies, and the algorithms for verbal and nonverbal generation around that content. And we, we want to, you know, structure conversations around the content of the story, and we're interested both in the fact that we have these deep representations, and then we kind of want to know, well, what could we do with good natural language processing if we, if we didn't have the deep representations, if we only just had the, the text of the story. And we're, we're trying to figure out, we're working with um, Emily Solari, Solari, who's at UC Davis, who works on reading comprehension. We're working on developing dialogue strategies that um, support interaction that are, that's aimed at learning. And you all know a whole lot about this, so I'm sure you can tell me you know, everything we're missing so far. So we have this corpus of story intention graphs for Aesop's fables. I'm going to show you an example of what one of these looks like, but you will not be tested on it later. Um, it's you know, a very deep representation of the story content. And we also have this other corpus that we created in the lab that we, that's called Persona Bank, where we thought that this story intention graph representation is so cool that we annotated ourselves. We used the story intention graph annotation tool to ourselves annotate some more informal stories from personal blogs. So we have stories about, you know, me and my kids went out looking for frog spawn, and you know, we found, you know, frog spawn, and this is, you know, we took the spawn home, and then, you know, so we have all these little informal stories that people post on places like LiveJournal. We, so we have those represented also uh, with this story content. And then we have, um, we have, human-generated dialogues from these stories as that are meant to be kind of exemplars of the dialogues that we would like to be able to generate automatically. And, um, and that's, that's another corpus that you can get off of our, off of our page. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about this stuff. So this story intention graph, is, I think it's a lovely representation of narrative structure. This is David Elson's thesis from Columbia. And what it does is it breaks the story down according to theories of narrative structure, so that you have like the, the textual parts of the story, that's the, that left-hand column, and then you have a timeline, so you have the story events ordered on a timeline. Then you have this kind of in, this interpretive layer where you kind of have inferences, deep inferences about the narrative content are represented like, why did the fox do that? What's the fox's goal? Is the fox being honest with the crow? You know, is he trying to, what, you know, what's his real goal? And then you have this affective layer, which says, like, who these actions are good for and who they're not. And you can make predictions, you know, like you can work with this affective layer. You can tell from that that at the end of the story, the fox is happy and the crow is not, right? Because she doesn't have the cheese and he has the cheese and he tricked her and all that, all that stuff is there, right? So you have this very deep and rich representation of the narrative content, and this is generated by a really nice annotation tool that is publicly available. And as I said, we've done a lot of that annotation. We've trained linguistic undergrads to do it, and um, we, you know, we really like it. Okay, so we have that, and then we have this corpus of gesture annotated stories. So this is work that we did with Michael Neff at UC Davis. Um, who has human body animation, and he has, a, he has a framework where he has 270 gestures, and those gestures are parameterizable so that each gesture can be performed um, according to different parameters. So like a hand gesture, you have control of parameters like how far the fingers are splayed, um, which direction the hand's going in, a bunch of stuff like that. For arm gestures, you know, you might have an arm gesture that's like a sweep like this, and you have control over the hand position 
while the gesture's going on, the gesture extent, the gesture speed, the gesture jerkiness, you know, there's a whole bunch of param you know, parameterizations on that gesture. So what we have in this corpus, see like cup under bar horizontal, that's a gesture in the 270. And then you have pointing abstract gesture, right? So those are gestures from this 270 gesture inventory and they're time aligned on the, on the storytelling and then we can render those gestures in different ways by controlling these parameters. And that's Chow's um, thesis work, so Chow Hu, um, who's almost, she's almost finished, right? So given, we have those resources, those data resources, we have software uh, for expressive personality generation for both verbal and nonverbal behaviors based on those kind of deep representations. And we have software for converting monologic storytellings to first-person dialogic tellings of stories. That was Kevin's first project in my lab when he was still an undergrad. And um, what we observe is that most stories that we'd be interested in for a learning context can be converted um, to dialogue with a narrator. You have to have a narrator agent. And then you have some stuff for the characters. And right now, what we think for engagement with a child, we think the most important thing is that the narrator agent be childlike and that we'd be able to do some matching, say, with ethnicity and gender. And we think we might be able to get away with having the characters just be kind of simple 2D kind of animations and not like, we're not trying to make a movie. We don't, we know we can't make a movie automatically. So we're gonna, you know, what we wanna do is animate the telling but mostly through the narrator character with the, um, with the story characters actually kind of more, some kind of more simple animation. So that's kind of where we are with that. We have a lot of dialogue management strategies that we propose. So among the things that we can do with our natural language generation engine is that if we detect, uh, for example, direct speech, the original story says, and then the fox said, he wanted her to sing, right? We have automatic um, algorithms for converting that into a script that says, you know, the fox said, uh, uh, you know, would you please sing for me, right? So we can convert, you know, we have the deep representation of the utterance and we can convert it to a direct speech realization. And then we can have the fox actually speak it, right? So instead of having the narrator say that the fox said that, you know, we actually have the fox speak it. And that's Stephanie Lucan's dissertation, and she's at the Army Research Lab now. And so that, that was, you know, so we have, all, we have a lot of stuff, we've been working a lot of stuff in this, in this narrative um, space, but like I said, we haven't quite fully taken it to like <laughs> dialogue with a, with a child because we didn't think the speech recognition would work. Um, and a lot of the work that we've done has been based on this idea that what you really need is for the language generation, you need uh, something that's very adaptable to the child, right? And so language generation is interesting because there has not been a lot of work on it for the last like 15 years. And part of it was because I think people realized around early 2000 that the speech recognition wasn't good enough to support a dialogue interaction. And a lot of the focus in the field went to improving speech recognition and language generation has only just come up then, like raised its head again in the last three years when um, people realized, well, you know, if you're gonna carry on a dialogue, you don't just have to understand what the person said, you actually have to be able to say something back. And, you know, you might have to carry on an extended conversation and so that we need some kind of mechanism for, for doing language generation. But in the meantime, we, we continued working on language generation. Um, and so we've done all this work using big five theory of personality uh, because that's meant to capture a lot of individual differences. And that, um, the idea that we could kind of express, we could automatically generate language expressing uh, personality led us to develop this architecture for natural language generator where again we have control of all these parameters that affect how things get said. So not, so at the, at the gesture level, we have control of parameters that, it's, that um, affect how a gesture gets rendered. And at the speech level, we have control of parameters that affect how a particular content 
get set, you know, with all these different um, kinds of parameters. So we can control, you know, the verbosity, the syntactic complexity, whether how a certain contrast relation is realized, whether you use kind of different kinds of social language, whether you use simple words or complex words. And we're trying to, that what we have here is not perfect for a narrative comprehension environment for teaching narrative comprehension. We kind of need different versions of a lot of these parameters, but we have a framework that we think is, go, you know, we're going to allow us to say like, you know, syntactic realization that, you know, this learner needs this, you know, this content broken down into multiple simple sentences. Whereas, you know, this person, it's probably be a good idea to, you know, make a complex sentence and then see if the learner can comprehend, you know, this more complex sentence of the same content. This is just like the, that this general framework of the personality, we can also find stuff in the psychology literature, the social psychology literature telling us exactly how these parameters that we can control kind of map onto personality expression. And then this is just a little simple example of, you know, like these different gesture things that I already demonstrated. So the thing with the EMU, I'm just going to take in like another minute with this. That project, we just got the funding for it from Hitachi in the middle of November. I'm super proud of Jackie and Kevin that they actually managed to make a demo by the end of December for them. And obviously there's still kind of a lot of um, stuff to do, you know, in that space. And it's similar to this other learning environment. We need to develop strategies for conversation around marine lab exhibit and methods for controlling the nonverbal behavior of the robot. There's not a direct mapping between the nonverbal avatar that we've been working with and what the robot can do. And again, but we want it to have a personality and we think it's really important that it be able to um, engage the child. So we have this, it's a really cute robot. <laughs> It's got a lot of articulation in its joints and stuff, but it doesn't have fingers, you know, so like when it does a pointy gesture, it kind of does this, you know, thing kind of like this, which you might, you know, not think is a pointy gesture, and it, um, it, it can't, um, it, ha it has a lot of really cute Japanese gestures that they programmed into it, which are not very interpretable to a Westerner, and there's a lot of really interesting stuff that we have to do to just kind of make it like suitable to interact with at all. But anyway, this is, this is a um, super fun kind of project.